appreciate that. I always wonder, but you guys have been so very kind. Uh, I'm preaching a sermon series, if you're new today, called um, Half-Truths. Often we, we say things or hear people say things that have just a sliver of truth in them. It kind of reminds me of our elderly friend, Tracy Justice. He was from West Virginia, and uh, he was just full of stories. I, we loved to sit around Sunday dinner with him and, and uh, hear his stories from West Virginia. And finally, I said, Tracy, are all of your stories true? He just said, oh, Brent, there's a thin line of truth in all of my stories. <laughs> That's true. He told stories to entertain, really. But often we say things that kind of sound right, and they kind of, they're kind of it's a salve for our soul whenever we're hurting. But then you go, well, boy, that just doesn't make a lot of sense with this passage, but it makes me feel better. And so, uh, I don't know if you have recognized this, but... but uh, the old enemy of the soul takes a sliver of truth and wraps it with a whole bunch of yuck. And that's how almost, you know, that's how every cult has started. So let's talk about something also that is a half, half truth this morning. I have a surefire way of starting a riot right here in church. Is everybody excited? The next time you're at a funeral for a scoundrel, get up and tell the total truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of the dearly departed, then step back and see what happens. It should be interesting. Because when it comes to funerals or memorial, memorial services, we have this deep-seated, unwritten, uh, we have these uh, deep-seated, unwritten rules. They're cultural norms that if we ignore them, it's to our great uh, moral peril. In our culture, funerals call for praise and fond memories. You put things in the best possible light. Funerals aren't really the time to be giving a critique or to be brutally honest. There's other times for that, right? It's a time for us to remember the best memories of the one that, that we have lost, even if he was the scoundrel of the family and everyone knew it. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I don't have a problem of, uh, of doing our best to remember the good side of someone. I get it why family and friends need comfort and not a cold bucket of truth splashed on them when they're trying to celebrate the life of someone who might be difficult in their family. I'm more than happy to set through the funeral of weird Uncle Festus, as families describe him as inquisitive and fun-loving. Yeah, that's okay. Or listening to them describe harsh and hot-headed Aunt Hilda as feisty and passionate. I don't even mind when cantankerous and old, mean farmer Fillmore is labeled as a straight shooter and an honest talker. But there's a place that I cringe. And so do you. We bite our tongues. And certainly I won't participate in something different if I'm officiating a funeral. It's the point at which wicked and sinful Uncle Frank 
who molested his little daughters without remorse and is described as going to a better place. The truth is, according to the Bible, he's not going to a better place. These last few weeks, we have started this series called Half-Truths. Popular culture tells us that Uh, tells us things that have just a little bit of truth in them, but when you study the scriptures, all they are are feel-good statements. I actually call, like to call it cotton candy theology. Any of you ever tasted cotton candy once in your life? Anybody disappointed? It's like there's this huge, massive ball of yummy, and you and you're like, what happened to it? And within a second, it's gone. Cotton candy theology, they look pretty and substantive on the outside, but as soon as you put them in your mouth, it just melts away with sugary absence. That's what cotton candy theology is. This morning, I'd like for us to wrestle with the half-truth If I live a good life, I deserve a good heaven. And other things the Bible doesn't say. Often we hear this when people say, well, he's in a better place. Well, if the word of God is our standard, where we get our truth, let's see what God says about that statement, okay? So in honor of reading God's word, would you please stand and turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. I'm very thankful for Larry Osborne, who's done some really good work on these statements. It's helped me to understand this passage so much better. Hear the word of the Lord. So I say, Paul says, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of of the flesh for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh they're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want but if you are led by the spirit you are not under the law the acts of the flesh are obvious Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. If I ask you to raise your hand to signify how many of you have ever heard a sermon on the reality of hell, I'm guessing just a few would. You would probably be over 60 years old, and you probably grew up in church. It's a painful subject, isn't it? And to be honest, it should be. Jesus and The Bible are quite clear that the wicked don't go to a better place. There's a real hell. Hell is not the devil's playground. It's not a perpetual wild party for those who just like to be in that setting. It's not a great eternal hangout for just those who are semi-bad. 
It's Satan's worst nightmare, actually. Unfortunately, there are many preachers and theologians who want us to believe that there's no hell, or if there is a hell, it's not as bad as you think. Here's a meme that I found. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of puppies and pancakes. Now, he didn't say that, but can I just say, this is not somebody that you want to go get your theology from. He's reading a different Bible than I am. Yet, for any pastor who has ever officiated a funeral knows the social pressure to offer assurances, even if it is wicked old Uncle Frank. It's incredibly strong because it's the last time people will gather to celebrate him or her. And at the point of death, lots of us believe and even want to be assured that the recently departed, though they lived a wicked life, they've gone to a better place because it helps us to feel better. The fact is, it's a myth. The Bible says that if you live a wicked life, you don't go to a better place. It has a nice ring to it, but it's not true. Paul said to the Galatians, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now that I'm on a roll and have been dropped by several Christmas card lists, I have to keep going. I have some more truth from the scripture, truth that might actually be harder to swallow than what I've just said. It's not only Uncle Frank who will spend eternity in hell, but the same goes for the sweet old lady next door who had never heard a fly, but who has never bowed her knees to the lordship of Christ. It goes, it's the same for the morally upright cousin who kept himself pure and honest and who even dedicated two years of his youth riding a bicycle as a missionary, more of a missionary, yet he belongs to a cult that believes that Jesus and Satan were brothers. Or the very sincere Buddhist elderly man, co-worker, who graciously battled cancer without a trace of bitterness and yet held closely to the tenets of his faith in reincarnation. You see, the, if the words of Jesus and the teachings of the New Testament mean what they say, then these wonderful people aren't in a better place. We might wish they were, but they're not. And I can tell you, these are not statements that I say with glee. I preach this truth with a very heavy heart. But I promised you that I would tell you the truth. So, is it completely true then that if I live a good life, I deserve a good heaven? It's not truth because it's merely wishful thinking. Let's pretend that I am on, I've been invited to be on that daytime show called The View. Can you imagine it? Just imagine me sitting around a table with five women, four of them the most liberal, politically correct women that you could even imagine, and one sacrificial lamb conservative is thrown in there just, just for the fun of it. 
Can you imagine having that job and being the only conservative? It really represents the worst of liberal media, and it represents all things politically correct and anti-Scripture. But just imagine I'm sitting at the table. Can you imagine what would happen around that table if I said one of these three statements? Believe in Jesus, believing in Jesus as the Christ is the exclusive and only way to find eternal salvation. Oxygen would suck out of that room. Or what if I said this? Salvation is received by faith in Christ and excludes actively living a life of person includes actively living a life of personal holiness. Or what if I said there is a reality of hell that awaits those who live a sinful life? You can you can just imagine the facial colors, blue, green, red, steam, headlines for weeks. I don't think I would ever be invited again. I'm confident that smoke would come out of their ears and they would chew me up and spit me out and they would be offended by my exclusivity. They would be disgusted with my high and mighty piety. They would call me a bigot for condemning people who, and calling what they do sin. Who am I to judge? Anybody remember last week's sermon? Our culture would reject such harsh and impossible, impossible moral laws. And it's not just the Hollywood elite or the media who would respond this way. In fact, many Christians believe this half-truth when they say God would never send someone to hell because he is such a good God and their friend was such a good person. And this denial of a judgment or a place called hell is nowhere more evident than when we deal with death. I can't tell you how many times I've stood in the foyer of one of my churches or a counseling room and heard this half-truth, even by believers who have spent their life studying the Scripture. In fact, have you noticed how people justify nearly everyone they know will go to a better place when they die. There's three primary reasons people justify nearly everyone going to a better place. The first is they point to a nod to God at some time in the person's life. They point back to a time when the person went to Sunday school at age eight. Or the person went to the altar about 10 years ago when that one song was being played. Do you remember that? Or they prayed the sinner's prayer at some point in their life. But this one-time event had nothing to do with the way the person lived his or her life. It changed nothing. This brief nod to God might be devoid of any spiritual fruit. It doesn't matter how casual, short-lived, or spiritually fruitless it might have been. I've even... I've often asked someone if a certain person was a believer. And the response sounds like this. Well, I know that whenever he was around six, he went to Sunday school. So I know he knows Jesus. Now, all of us knew he had a real bad drug problem, hasn't attended church in years. He liked the women and skimmed the money from the company, but... He knew Jesus whenever he was young. Therefore, he's going to a better place. And if we can't find evidence of 
a fleeting Jesus nod moment, we turn to another standard. It's the virtue standard. They point out the goodness of the person. I've had many conversations with people who speak of the person as a saint simply because the person was a good neighbor. He would never hurt anyone. And it was coupled with a smidgen of a religious value system. We often hear people pull out the, he had a good heart card. I know he had a good heart. He meant well. He just got sucked into the wrong crowd. It's the card we often play when evidence points somewhere else. And there's a a, a number three. They identify the sincerity of the person's faith in anything. I had an interesting conversation with a lady at one of my other churches when I had preached on the exclusivity of Christ, meaning that it is only by faith in Christ alone that we are saved. That's scriptural, right? She kindly came up to me after the service and met me about mid-aisle. And she, she said that she felt that someone who was extremely committed at anything, as an extremely committed Buddhist or even a Mormon could not, God would not hold it against them if they were extremely committed to it and let them go into heaven. So I asked her a question. I said, ma'am, if you were in a boat and you needed to float to safety and you picked up a very heavy anchor and you strapped it to you and you hugged it tight and you believed with all your heart that it was going to help you float and you jumped out of the boat with it tied to you, would you float? And she said, well, that doesn't count. That's science. And this is religion. The fact is, even sincerely believing with all of your heart in something that is false will not get you into heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man will see the Father except through any possible way, except through me. The fact is, it doesn't matter whether they had a momentary nod to God years ago or whether they had a good heart or whether they were sincere in their belief towards anything. The fact is, it totally is at odd with the scripture. Larry Osborne once said, eternal destiny isn't determined by where we wish people would go. It's not determined by where everyone says they went. It's determined by where God puts us, or more precisely, by where we put ourselves. And by now, some of you perhaps have begun to think think that I have been harsh or narrow-minded by saying that some of your good friends or relatives might actually be in eternal punishment. I would just encourage you not to blame me, but it's what Christ said. He is actually the one who said the path was narrow and only few would enter that path. He didn't dance around the issue. I I confess this is a messy subject and I would much rather be smiling and talking about 
daisies and grace and forgiveness, and I promise you that will be coming. But I don't know if you remember. On August, I believe it was uh, October the 21st, three years ago, I stood right here preaching my first official sermon as your pastor. And I held this Bible up and I promised you that what I preached would be from this word of God and it would be the truth. Therefore, at times, I have to deal with issues that we would really rather not talk about it because it's painful. There's bad memories with it and our hearts hurt because there are certain loved ones that probably aren't in the presence of God because of the truth of what I'm speaking about, but it comes from the scripture. So why is it important that we understand the reality of hell? Why not leave such uncomfortable and politically incorrect discussion for someone else? Well, doing so would not only put us at odds with the Bible and many times put us at odds with very specific things that Jesus spoke. Here are four reasons why it's important for us to talk about it. The first is this. The Bible clearly teaches the reality of an eternal punishment. If you don't want to believe in the Scripture uh, about what it says about hell, you're going to have to get your scissors out. Matthew 18.9 says, It is better to have one eye than to have two and be cast into hell. Galatians 5, those who live in sin will not inherit the kingdom of God. 2 Thessalonians 1, God will punish those he does not know and who do not obey him. Matthew 23, Jesus asks the hypocritical Pharisees how they will escape being condemned to hell. Did you know that Jesus and the apostles spoke of an eternal punishment dozens of times? In fact, about 46 times. Even then, I'm amazed at how there are some popular pastors and theologians and authors who try their best to ex explain away the more uncomfortable parts of of what Jesus was talking about related to who can go to heaven and who will go to hell. They preach a feel-good gospel that, has, that says that everyone will go to heaven. We call that universalism. Everybody in the universe is going to go to heaven because God loves everyone. and He would never send somebody to hell. The fact is, he doesn't send people to hell. People decide themselves that they will go to hell. Did you know that hell was created for Satan and his demons? It wasn't created for man. And they try to, the, these popular preachers, they, they try to accommodate our pop culture where no one is a loser. Everything goes. Nothing is wrong ever. We don't want to hurt people's feelings. The problem is, it's just not biblical. And if there is no eternal punishment, it devalues Christ's death on the cross. In fact, if everyone, no matter how evil, goes to a better place, then why in the world did Christ have to be beaten and whipped and crucified and finally suffer a death? Why did he have to do that if everyone was going to go to hell, uh, heaven? The whole centrality of the death and the resurrection of Jesus would be of no real importance if the cross did not purchase the freedom from a life of sin. 
and purchase an eternity with Christ in heaven. This is the time that you all say amen. That's good news. It was the death and the resurrection of Jesus that purchased our freedom. And if everyone goes to heaven, why in the world did Christ have to go through all of that? If there is no eternal punishment, it decreases our evangelistic urgency. Early church believers felt so passionate about the need to evangelize that they were willing to die for that privilege. You've heard the stories of our first uh, missionaries going from the West to Africa, packed all of their goods in a coffin put it on a ship knowing that they would never go home. They would die because they were privileged to tell the Christ story. Can I ask you, when was the last time you wept tears of grief, crying out in prayer for the salvation of someone that you loved? Some of you will probably say it was last night. It's unfortunate that many believe that evangelism is no longer worth dying for. It's hardly worth stressing a relationship for. I read one pastor who wrote, the biggest roadblock to sharing our faith is no longer the loss of our lives, our jobs, or our families. It's the fear of embarrassment. We just don't want to be embarrassed so I'm not going to share my faith with my colleague. May we ever feel the urgency of praying and fasting for those who are lost. Jude, the brother of Jesus, wrote about his desire for people to have this evangelistic fervor. He he wrote, In Jude 21 and 23, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire and save them to others. Show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by the corrupted flesh. And number four, if there's no eternal punishment, it turns obedience into an extra credit spiritual add-on. When giving a nod to God is all it takes to be right with God, then everything else, unfortunately, becomes extra credit. I don't mean to, to imply that we have some we have to somehow earn our salvation that's certainly not true we could never pay for our salvation but at the same time the presumption that we can live like hell and still be confident of ending up in heaven is an idea that Jesus and the authors of the new testament say are is absolutely untrue Paul said that we must actively live out the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's how we live out our faith. And Jesus spoke of this connection between loving and obeying. He said in John 14, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. God requires that we do our best to live and act in a way that exemplifies holiness and the fruit of the Spirit. In his book, Loving God, Chuck Colson tells the story of a Hollywood gangster named Mickey Cohen. Apparently, Mickey attended a Billy Graham crusade and afterwards decided that he would accept Christ, as he called it. 
Later, when informed by Billy Graham's associates that as a new Christian, he needed to cut ties with his mob friends, Mickey was incredulous, incredulous. He said, you never told me that I had to give up my career. You never told me that I had to give up my friends. These are Christian movie stars, Christian, uh, uh, I'm sorry, he said, there are Christian movie stars, there are Christian athletes, there are Christian businessmen, so what's the matter with being a Christian gangster? The book title there somewhere. He said, if we have to give up all of that, if that's Christianity, count me out. Now, admittedly, a a Christian gangster is a bit out of there. But why do we feel like it's okay to be a Christian adulterer? Why is it okay to be a Christian gossip? Why do we often feel it's okay to be a Christian tax thief? The government really doesn't need all that. Or a Christian drunk. Why would we ignore the sinful actions of people and still feel that it's okay for us to say that they are in a better place? And like gangster Mickey, we relegate obedience to this statues of an extra credit add-on for those who are really into this Jesus thing. The truth is, living a holy life, obediently following Jesus in both spirit and in action is not just expected, but it's required. Would you please stand? The Bible is full of stories of people who knew God and yet they did hellish things. I don't need to remind you of stories like the murderer by the name of Moses or the adulterer called King David. King David. But thankfully, they later became leaders in the development of God's people because of godly, holy actions that they took afterwards. And we find comfort in these stories because many of us, yea, verily, all of us have found ourselves in a place far from God. But then we came to know him and we fell in love with him. And we made decisions to follow him. There became a commitment that he would be our Lord and our Savior. And our lives changed. We began to act differently. And the fruits of God's Spirit began to be showing in our life and others confirmed them. I'm guessing that's why we have all fallen in love with the story of the prodigal son so much. Because we saw ourselves in him. And we also saw ourselves receiving the love of the Father. It's certainly true that good and godly people can fall into sin. Either suddenly or as a result of a series of steps in the wrong direction. We've all watched it. And without a doubt, we all struggle with sin. Even the writers of the scriptures did so. But would you also agree that setting up camp in the land of disobedience and then staying there and then defending it as no big deal is not what God requires? That's not something that real Christians do. 
The Apostle John put it this way, the man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's not an obscure scripture. It's pretty clear. Some of you have felt the sting of truth this morning, perhaps. If you have given a nod to Jesus by attending church and saying a few words of faith, throwing a couple bills in the offering, and yet you've lived a sinful life. You have heard the unfortunate truth this morning from a pastor who loves you. In fact, loves you enough to tell you the truth. That you will spend eternity without God in severe punishment, a punishment that was only created for Satan only. That's the truth. But can I tell you the good news? The good news is that the truth will set you free. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if this morning you want to make sure that when you die, people aren't gathering around the foyer or the pastor's office trying to pull together the kind of good things that we could say. If this morning you want to make sure that when you die, you truly will go to a better place, it's promised to you can I encourage you to do just a couple things before you leave this morning? And I'm going to be inviting you to come to the altar. You know why? I'm not asking you to stand at your seats. Because what I'm asking you to do has eternal ramifications. It's not to be hidden. It's a decision that is public. You make a personal decision, but it's publicly proclaimed. So I'll be asking you to come to the altar when we sing. Can I tell you how you know you will go to a better place? Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and make you new. Simple as that. Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and make you new. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and, hallelujah, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You've tried to do it all of your life. John is saying this is how you get it done. It's not you. It's Christ who cleanses and removes that unrighteousness if you ask by faith. And then invite Jesus to take up residence in your home. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says. If any man hears my voice, and opens the door, I promise I will come in and have fellowship with him. It's a promise. The Jesus is not going to force his way in. He could. But he's going to be a gentleman and just knock and wait to be invited. It's your choice. And the last is this. 
Commit to live a, an, a life, an active life of holiness with spiritual fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's all. You've tried to do it yourself. And you and I know it was a failure. You have failed and failed and tripped and failed. What if it was as easy as just inviting Christ to forgive the past, take up residence in your own heart, and then in the future, let God deal with it? What if it was that easy? I'm going to pray. And if you'd like to come down as I'm praying or as we sing, I would invite you. Because, friends, what I have said this morning is God's truth. Father, we are dependent on you. We are inviting you to take up residence in our homes, to radically change our hearts, that you might be honored in all way, so that when we die, we truly will go to a better place, not because we deserve it, but because you have gifted to, to us. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.
Thank you, Jesus. not very often that we come to a place that our eternal destiny is so forefront in our minds. It's something that we don't talk and dream about every day, I know, even pray about. We pray, and by faith, we trust, and we go on. But it just seems as if this morning the Holy Spirit has taken the truth and placed it in front of us. And some of that truth is pretty difficult. Some of that truth hurts. Maybe not as much for us personally, but we know that truth affects those who have gone before, of how we understand what happened. Or it affects some of our loved ones, our children, or our siblings, or maybe spouse. Can I just say, every year when I start a new year, on that first Sunday of January, I look out into my church family, and I know Because of a church this size, there will be someone missing the next year. It's just, it's the law of averages. So far in history, there is a one-to-one factor from birth to death. If you are born, you will always die so far. And as I look into my congregation, my heart celebrates in one way and is burdened in other ways because I know there will be some who will pass away. And I know that next year in July, we will have a different congregation because God will choose. There will be some who will die. Some who will go through some really significant trials, journeys, medical challenges, marriage challenges. It's life. But can I tell you this morning, as it seems as if the Holy Spirit is near to us and he has placed truth right in front Can I tell you that is a gift of the Holy Spirit? He loves you so much that he is saying, this is the word of the Lord. How will you make a decision because of it? And I'm going to ask Darla to sing the chorus one more time. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of us who have given our life to Christ. But could you spend that time where you are praying, thanking Jesus for the truth? We don't accept Christ because there's a promise of hell. That's not why we accept Christ. We accept Christ because he's invited us to have a personal relationship with him and we get to help him redeem the earth 
He doesn't save us to go to heaven only. He saves us so that we can help redeem the earth that he values so much. We're not treading water until we die. That's not what he wants. There's another sermon there somewhere, and I promise I'm not going to preach it right now. But as she sings, could we just bow our heads and say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for redeeming me. And now (laughs) you have given me a responsibility to evangelize, to fast on behalf of my kids, to pray for my siblings, to pray for that one neighbor that is just a... (laughs) To my backside. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me the opportunity to express your holiness. So she's going to sing another chorus, and let's just thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the truth. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just as I am. up in the Fulton Church of God Holiness in Fulton, Missouri. My family went to church all the time. My mother was a believer. I didn't know that my father was not a believer until I was about 13 years old when he came down to an altar during a revival, and I was shocked. Because I just thought my dad was a believer in Jesus because we all were. He said the right things. He took us to church. But it was on that night that he accepted Christ as his personal Savior. Our family sat right back there all the time. About five rows from the back. And I grew up under some really good preaching, great revivals. And for some reason, God gave me a soft heart towards him. And very early in my life, I accepted Christ. Can I tell you, it was this place. that I always ended when that song was played. This was my reserve spot. In fact, me and little Stevie Biswell would try to head towards her. I got there first sometimes. He would get there first other times. But God gave me a soft heart towards the Spirit of God. And I'm so thankful that I had pastors who said, Brent, this is the truth. Read it. Believe it. Live your life on this truth. I'm so thankful. And I know that many of us here did not grow up in churches like that. Some of you didn't even grow up in church. But aren't you thankful that today you're in a church that says biblical faithfulness is what it's about? My friends, don't forget that you have a Bible. Don't just remember it on Sunday. 
On Monday, read your Bible. On Wednesday, make sure you're memorizing. On Friday, when you're making a business decision, ask Solomon in Proverbs, how do I make a good business decision? Every day. The Holy Spirit is so good that when you say, Father, I need to know the truth, He wants to tell the truth to you. He doesn't want to hide it. He wants to tell you. I want to preach more. But I'll give you this benediction, and it's so important. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory majesty power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore so now In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace, because he's already gone before.